Let's go on to our next speaker, uh, who is a close friend of mine, um, Dr. Aris Nozick, who used to be uh, my partner at uh, Maimonides as a neurointerventionist and vascular neurosurgeon. Uh, Dr. Nozick is very talented in multiple ways, as you, you, you'll hear. Um, before um, he moved to uh, become the director of cranial bypass program at the Wayne Lagoon Health and endovascular neurosurgery at Belleville Hospital Center, he was the neuroendovascular and uh, neurovascular director at Maimonides. He graduated from um, Bangkok Young University, if I pronounce it correctly, um, and um, at Nagave, and completed his uh, neurointerventional radiology fellowship training at NYU Guzman School of Medicine, uh, and a neurovascular and endovascular neurosurgery fellowship training at North Shore LIJ University Hospital. As a native of Israel, he served in the Israeli Air Force and was a, uh, fascinated by the advanced technology of the jet aircraft that he flew. Um, so it was these technological um, intricacies that attract him to become a neurosurgeon where technology plays a significant role in OR. Through a minimally invasive endovascular approach or open vascular neurosurgery, Dr. Nozick specializes in treating patients with variety of neurovascular disease, including multimodal disease, intracranial atherosclerotic disease, and carotid stenosis. He also treats patients who present with brain aneurysm, with aneurysm with breath, AVMs, and arterial fissures, as well as uh, neurovascular um, conflicts that necessitate microvascular or microvascular decompression. He also, of course, treats acute ischemic stroke as well. Dr. Mosek also utilizes complex surgical methodology with cutting edge technology, including virtual reality, virtual reality, I'm sorry, virtual reality systems and uh, interoperative local perfusion in performing cranial bypass surgeries. He has deep passion for research with special focus on understanding the clinical aspect of and genetics of cardiac web. Today, he's gonna to talk about the um, management of uh, cardiac web. Let's welcome Dr. Nosek. Um, hi, everyone. Good morning, almost afternoon. Um, it is a great honor, actually, for me uh, to participate in this symposium and uh, to give this talk. Um, obviously, uh, as Tony said, actually, it was, uh, I was here, I came here actually in 2015. It was uh, my first attending position after my training. Um, and uh, it was, uh, I have great memories from this place. Um, good, very good emotions, and um, it's uh, it, it's a feel as if I'm coming back to my previous home. So uh, I obviously immediately told Tony that I'm I'm really excited to uh, to come and give a talk here in your symposium. So thank you so much for having me. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about carotid web, which I actually didn't know what it is until I came to my fellowship in 2013. Um, and um, I'm really fascinated by the uh, by this pathology, and um, I got like really deep into it. So I'm um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Um, so I would like to start with this case. Um, it was sent to us um, from one of our uh, colleagues in uh, Sweden. It's a 33-year-old uh, man with uh, no past medical history. Arrived with right hemiplegia and uh, aphasia, and you can see here. Can you see the cursor? Perfect. Um, you can see here this um, LVO in the left MCA, um, complete occlusion. They took him uh, to the angiosuite suite to perform thrombectomy with the suction device. Great result. Sent him back up to the ICU. Um, and then 60 hours later, uh, he uh, had same symptoms in the ICU. Took him back down to the uh, angiosuite. suite with another great results. Very happy, they went up uh, again to the ICU. And then 33 hours again, same symptoms. Now it's a little bit more proximal, but still acute clot, as you can see. Again, great result um, with the um, suction. And then again, 
So this is his fourth stroke in five days. Uh, again, great result. Um, this time uh, um, they got another Tiki 3, um, Tiki 3 result. Um, and then they looked actually a little bit uh, lower to, towards the, the level of the neck and they found this lesion. And this lesion is actually carotid web. So that's a great case just to present the whole story, I think, of the recent years of carotid web. It's an under-recognized, obviously, uh, source of stroke. It's a formal of intimal uh, fibromuscular dysplasia. And basically, it's a shelf-like projection of intimal fibrous tissue into the carotid web, uh, bulb. And you can see it here in the 3D reconstruction that uh, one of my partners, Dr. Shapiro, did. Actually, the first description is uh, from the late 60s, as you can see, in Annals of Surgery. Uh, this is a paper by Rainer et al. that uh, described the patient with recurrent strokes. Um, actually, he had same kind of same story. Um, they uh, did multiple angiograms, but back then in the uh, in the 60s, they used to puncture the uh, the internal carotid artery. So basically, they punctured above the level of the web multiple times until they did the uh, femoral axis. And then they found this, this web. What they did back then is actually they resected the whole web. We'll talk about that. They resected the, uh, the segment of the carotid and re-anastomosis um, like in the direct end-to-end -end anastomosis. Um, since that uh, late 60s, there are multiple uh, reports, about 70 reports. Most of it is case reports and the case series level, not more than that. But we're getting more and more into the data and I'll show you what we have until now. Um, this is a paper that we uh, uh, recently published. A, it's a cohort study. It's a collaboration with, uh, with Brown University uh, and the meta-analysis. And we actually wanted to, to look into the uh, prevalence of ipsilateral carotid web in ischemic stroke patients. Um, these are all patients that were admitted for during five years between 2012 and 2017. Uh, almost 900 patients, and you can see a really minimal amount of patients, uh, uh, four patients with ipsilateral carotid web. Um, all patients were in the group when they looked at cryptogenic stroke group, and three out of them, out of the four, were younger than 60. Um, then we performed the meta-analysis uh, um, from the literature of uh, 3,000 patients, uh, with pool prevalence that show that uh, within this specific group of patients younger than 60 with cryptogenic strokes, it's 13%. So if you look at this specific group, it's much higher. Um, what about the pathology? The pathology of this, uh, as, as you know, per the books, the hallmark of this, of this lesion is the absence of calcifications or any kinds of atherosclerotic disease, nothing of that. But um, actually, we have one patient that had like kind of uh, some calcifications, but basically that's the hallmark. There are no descriptions in these specific patients of other regions with FMD. And the histology is a uh, compound of fibrous tissue throughout the media. There's intimal hyperplasia and the adventitia is never involved in this disease. And you can see here the, uh, the histology, the spindle cells, uh, and mixed with uh, background on the H and E on the uh, azochromine, there's matrix deposition, and the in the immunohistochemistry, you can see spindle cells uh, are uh, immunoreactive for um, smooth muscle actin. And here you can see the pathology of one of these uh, uh, lesions that we actually resected. Um, what about the pathophysiology? So these are all theories, obviously, um, but. Uh, What's in, interesting there is that there's extremely rare cases where there's severe stenosis at the level of the of the uh, of this shelf of this uh, carotid web. So we think that there's recirculation of blood just distal above the level of the web. Um, there's disruption of the laminar flow, and then there's clot formation. And why do we think? Because multi multiple multiple issues. First of all. On formal angiogram, we can really see contrast, contrast stagnation just distal to the web, which obviously mimics the blood that can uh, create actually stagnation of blood there. Then we also found and uh, there are multiple documentations of thrombus at the level of the web from patients that 
uh, their web was resected. And different than the plaque, than the atherosclerotic plaque, there's, it's a very smooth kind of segment and a very short segment. So we do think that there's something with the recirculation of the blood above the level of the web. Actually, on the Mr. Clean study, they uh, uh, they took part of these uh, uh, patients and uh, they created flow models of the web and compared it to the contralateral uh, carotids and they show recirculation at the level of the web just above it. Um, they really did measure transverse wall shear stress higher and oscillatory shear index values as compared to the, the contralateral side. And then they uh, obviously also think that there, uh, there is increased tendency of thrombus formation because of this different uh, um, flow flow above the level of the web. So here's a patient. Um, this is the CT angio sagittal view, as you can see. And this is the same patient from my uh, endotrectomy that we performed. And I, I just kind of try to show the uh, the flow coming from below here, you see, and here it's like, uh, parallel to it on the real one, then there is this disruption of flow just above the level of the of the web, which is basically here. You can see the shelf here of the web, and then creates a clot, and the clot flies up to the level to the brain. Um, so here's a, a, a case of a contrast stagnation, and you can see this is an early stage, early arterial phase. You can see the web is basically here. You can barely see some contrast coming up above it because it go, runs up distal to it, then the uh, the real arterial phase, you can really see now the web itself, and then it stays. You can see this is the parenchymatic phase, still contrast there, and still in during the, the venous phase, this is the internal jugular vein, and still there's contrast there. Um, and here's another example for why do we think that there's clot formation above the level of the web. That's a patient that arrived with two strokes, uh, and it was, I think, two or three weeks apart, and you can see this is the same size, same exact vessel. And you can see that the, the, uh, the, the pathology here looks completely different. Why? Because there's probably a clot above here. And you can see also this is before, and that's two weeks after. You can see that the lesion really looks completely different. So it looks different because there's a, an, addition, an additional clot on top of the web. And uh, here's a, uh, that's a patient that we uh, performed the uh, thrombectomy. Uh, you can see the, the, the um, using just a uh, Sophia with suction device. And then here in this short, short video, you can see there's not a lot of stagnation, but there is kind of haziness really at the level of the web. You see this haziness here is a clot. So we have multiple reasons to believe that there is a clot up there. Here's another case that we performed and uh, we took out the web. This is actually the level of the web. This is this shelf. And you can see here what I marked here is when I took it out, there was a real clot really on top of it, inside that. Um, what about imaging? Um, so as you saw before, it's a shelf-like tissue. Usually, usually, um, and I'll show you something which is a little bit different. Usually it's at the posterior wall the posterior wall of the carotid bulb. Um, it's best visualized on sagittal projection of the CT angio. I never, and I put never in quotation because never associated with calcification, but we saw one patient that had some calcified plaque above and below the web. Um, there's no significant stenosis. There's no additional FMD changes in the, uh, um, in the imaging. And there's this septum um that was first described in the very first description there's a septum on axial imaging now i want to say something about the septum because many uh radiologists called me and said maybe it's a web but there's no septum so what's the story of this septum so take a look at this first case here it really depends where and which level do we do the axial cut because if we do the axial cut at really at this level it looks like a septum, because the tip of the web creates a false septum on an axial on an axial image. But if we look at this specific web, and it's a web because we resected it, and we know that it's a web, and we are putting this axial cut, it doesn't look like a, like a septum. 
or if we look at the third image, this is also a this is also a carotid web, and if we put the axial cut here, it doesn't look like a septum. So it's not a must to see a septum on an axial image uh, in order to uh, um, to diagnose carotid web. More about imaging, what are the imaging modalities that we use? CTA is the, probably the best imaging modality because first of all, we can create a good sagittal view to show this kind of shelf. Uh, we can also see the calcifications. We can create 3D these days and it, it looks uh, really, really good on uh, CT Angel. What about DSA? DSA is kind of, you know, we cannot do a final diagnosis with DSA. Uh, we have to create some 3D analysis for that because the projection is extremely important. Many times you will miss it if you're not doing the correct projection in order to uh, um, um, demonstrate the web. Uh, what you do see is the stagnation that I just showed you um, um, a few uh, slides ago. What about ultrasound? I'm trying to see if I can see, if I can find uh, based on ultrasound, it's very, it's actually very difficult. I did manage to see here, this is a butterfly uh, uh, ultrasound. I could see the, the web here, but uh, not always can you see the web. What about differential diagnosis in terms of the, of the imaging? Uh, this is taken actually from a paper, from a review paper that we published in uh, a few years ago in Journal of Neuro Neurology, Neurosurgery and Psychiatry. And you can see these are all look like, uh, according to the images that I just showed you, this, all of them look like carotid web. But uh, we know that this one is actually a thrombus. It's just a thrombus, intraluminal thrombus. This one is, was actually found to be a, just a soft plaque, which looks like a perfect web. This one is actually a dissection um, uh, that was treated conservatively. And the, uh, the last one is actually a carotid web. And you remember I told you that I'll show you one classification on a, on a carotid web, so this is that case. So there are differential diagnoses, um, and it really depends obviously on the clinical story and uh, other uh, imaging modalities. So now shifting gear to the management. Um, I'm going to talk now, uh, I'll, I'll add some more, so, some more uh, uh, points about asymptomatic carotid web, but I want to start with talking only about symptomatic carotid web. Um, there are still uh, places that are treating carotid webs that presented with symptoms like TIAs or stroke with just antiplatelet medications. Uh, some of them do use single agent, other do use uh, dual antiplatelet for a few weeks or few months, and then they move to a, a single agent. Um, there is no randomized control trial for this uh, specific uh, carotid web treatment. Um, other centers did publish their results uh, with the case reports actually um, treating with anticoagulation. This is kind of make more sense in terms of the mechanism, as we said, that it's, a, it's a actually a clot um, above the level of the web. Um, but what we need to remember that uh, as compared to carotid plaque, any kind of medication would not remodel this lesion. It's a fixed lesion. We cannot fix it. We cannot change it uh, with medications. What about intervention? So on that uh, table on the, on the, uh, the right side of the, of the screen, you can see these are actually the, um, the major, I would say, case series of treatment of symptomatic carotid webs. For one of our, from one of our papers. Um, so basically, it's either surgical resection, and I'll talk about the options shortly, or carotid stenting. Um, in terms of overall, we know that in both modalities, uh, we didn't see uh, recurrency, and I'm going to talk about that as well. Um, either carotid endotrectomy or carotid stenting. So this is a case um, that was done by Dr. Tanweer, which was uh, one of our previous uh, um, colleagues at NYU. Um, this is a patient with, you, you can see the carotid web here, you can see the stagnation above the level of the web, um, and he stented it. Um, and you can see that um, the web is still there, obviously. You cannot get rid of it as compared to, um, even if you do some balloon angioplas angioplasty after these cases, you cannot get rid of it as compared to, to, to a plaque, to an atherosclerotic plaque. I'm sure that you've seen 
beautiful images uh, after COVID uh, um, stenting due to, to do uh, an arterial plaque, uh, especially after you do balloon and geoplasty. It really looks perfect here. Uh, almost always there is kind of a residual bulge, but and there's some stagnation, but we, he definitely managed to change the flow and the uh, recirculation above the level of the web. And that's why this treatment is, is quite a good treatment as well. Um, in respect to surgical, surgical options, surgical resections, there are basically two options. Um, um, the most used option is carotid endarterectomy, but there are some uh, centers that are doing actually internal carotid artery resection and then they reanastomose end to end. Um, this is a group from Paris. That's the largest series they found in the literature. Um, they did treat 11 patients with this technique. The problem with this technique is that may, many times the web is really at the level of the bifurcation. So I'm not sure how can you really resect it without resecting the external, the internal, and part of the uh, of the common if you really want to get rid of the whole the whole segment. Otherwise, you need to create kind of some diagonal shape of this resection and then connect it end to end. I think it's uh, it's more complex than the 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 carotid endotrectomy, and I'm going to show you some other results. Anyways, in this specific uh, group of patients, 11 patients, they had great results long term. Um, so what are we doing uh, in terms of the endotrectomy, which is uh, kind of the same same treatment, same carotid endotrectomy, but a little bit different. Um, so the patient is obviously um, supine. We turn the head, we localize the uh, bifurcation. We can do really a very short and minimalistic uh, uh, incision because, again, it's a very, very short segment that we need to treat. Um, and then we do all these patients under neuromonitoring, monitoring, assessing SSCPs and MEPs uh, during the procedure. The opening is regular opening. We do a neck dissection. We open the carotid sheet and get control on the inter external, internal, and common carotid arteries. Um, we then perform a very short linear uh, um, arteriotomy, as you can see here. Um, we um, create, we usually do these cases, actually all these cases were done under microscope because I really want to find the level of the media and at the level of the media I try to develop a plane below the level of the web so I can take the whole web uh, circumferentially uh, out um, with no residual. Um, we remove the web as a block and block fashion and uh, we then back bleed the arteriotomy, we revascularize uh, the external, the common, we wait a bit just to see that everything is okay, and then we um, uh, revascularize the internal carotid artery. We are not using any patch, again, because the arteriotomy is extremely short. There's no reason to use a patch. We just primarily uh, closure um, with the 6-0 proline. And the advantages, especially over carotid stenting, um, is that first of all, all these patients or most of these patients um, carry a very low risk because they're usually young, they have no comorbidities and they tolerate very well the cross clamping because the contralateral carotid is again, is widely open. There's no stenosis in the contralateral carotid. So uh, we think that uh, the risk is very low when we trap the, um, the, the segment. Uh, we do get pathological confirmation. So don't forget these are patients that until they got the diagnosis of carotid web, underwent uh, uh, the whole workup for any kind of other reasons for strokes in the young adults. So in the end, these patients, once we take the carotid web, we look under the microscope, we know that's it, they are done. Uh, we have the reason and they, uh, they also don't need to be on any kind of uh, antiplatelet medications because the carotid, their web is out. Um, and uh, obviously, if we use it as stand, we need to put them on dual antiplatelet for a while, then uh, they'll stay obviously on a single agent, um, and here they don't need that. Um, so this is the carotid web. This is the common, external, and internal. You can see how I develop here the plane between, in, actually, this is the media, and this is the carotid web. Um, we did uh, review our um, results we did publish it in the Journal of Neurosurgery. 
uh, again a few years ago, but this is kind of updated. Um, I added May because I just I just did another case on Monday. Uh, so all patients were symptomatic. We have 21 patients uh, during this last uh, four years, I would say. Um, we did one carotid stenting and 20 carotid endotrectomies, so we know they are carotid webs. 70%, um, about 70% are women, um, about 60% are African American. Um, the mean age is young, as you can see, about 50. 50% um, of them presented with large vessel occlusion. That's a lot. Um, so in all these patients, we really, uh, you really want to go and start with common carotid artery injection, verify that there's nothing at the level of the uh, bifurcation, and go then into intracranially and distal into the internal carotid artery. Um, third of them, third of them presented after at least two strokes. Um, so lots of patients with recurrent strokes uh, that were were not diagnosed on time, obviously. Um, the surgical result, all patients tolerated the, this procedure very well. There were no uh, neuromonitoring compromise at all. Uh, there were no perioperative complications, no permanent neurological deficit. We had one case where the bifurcation was a little bit uh, uh, higher at the level of C2. So it involved a little bit the hypoglossal, so we did some manipulation on that. Uh, she woke up with uh, some uh, uh, tongue deviation that resolved after three months. Uh, and there were no recurrence, and I can say that a part of the last patient we did on Monday. So this, she's, uh, she's at home, but she's, we didn't follow her yet. Um, so this is how it looks. It's a short video, so you can see this is the common carotid artery, external and internal. Uh, it's about a 1.3 millimeter of, uh, a centimeter, sorry, of an arteriotomy. Um, And here you can see how you can really develop a plane um, and resect it very smoothly. You see that the uh, the, the wall of the uh, of the carotid below the level of the web is really clean and nice. There's no no athero at all, and you can see how nice it it comes and it's gone. There is no recurrence after such a uh, closure. This is the uh, primary closure. Um, and revascularization. Releasing the internal, some hemostasis. It's a, it's a nice and pretty quick case, probably an hour. Um, so now, now that we know how carotid web look, now I'm going to show you that not all the webs actually look like a web, and uh, I think it's a very important part of my talk. Um, so this is a patient that arrived with, um, this is a CT angio of a patient that arrived with large vessel occlusion, underwent throm thrombectomy. Looks kind of, you know, minimal irregularity here, but nothing special. Um, this is the angio, a formal angio that my partners did. Um, and you can see nothing uh, really impressive in this. Uh, and you can see they did multiple projections. Uh, very difficult to say that there's a lesion really at the level of the uh, carotid bifurcation here. But um, um, there are these, um, Dr. Shapiro and Dr. Raz, my partners there that are doing, we are doing these strokes cases are really meticulous. And you can see they did actually 3D with DynaCT. And only on this image, you can see that there's some kind of <clears throat> shelf here. Even in the 3D, this 3D, it's difficult to see, but here you can definitely see that there's an issue. And this patient had the carotid web resected it, and she did this is like two years ago. She never had an additional stroke, and it's a carotid web. Here's another case. Um, it's a 33 year old patient again, um, young patient that came with multiple strokes, um, and you can you can barely see something like a very very small protruding lesion, um, and I actually didn't want to operate on him, um, but our stroke neurologist really really pushed me. Uh, to operate, and um, and I was um, I, I hesitated a lot. In the end, what I decided to do is I took them. I took him to the hybrid operating room because I was not sure that I'm even going to find something and manage to take it out. So I said, okay, I'll take him to the hybrid room. I'll shoot an angio. I'll see that I'm 
the level of this web. I'll resect it, I'll open. And then once I take it out, I'll shoot another run just to see that I got rid of it. Um, we usually don't do that for coordinate arterectomy. There's no reason to do it for coordinate arterectomy and not even for webs. But this one, it's like a one milli, I don't know, two millimeters of protrusion. Um, um, but here's why they, they really insisted the stroke neurologist. Take a look at this, at this run. Take a look at the stagnation, still there, contrast still there, still there. Now it's already the internal, internal, jugular, internal jugular vein and the contrast is still hanging there. And, and that's why they actually uh, really pushed me to, to do this case. Um, and this is just the magnified view of before in the hybrid room. And you can see this is actually the lesion. In the end, it was a little bit bigger than what I expected. Um, and then I shot another um, run just immediately post after I, uh, I closed the, the, the artery, uh, the arteriotomy, and you can see that it's not there and um, never had an additional stroke. Here's another patient um, in this group of not all webs look like a web. And I took this image just to, um, to make a point. This is a guy that uh, under, came to his orthopedic surgeon um, with weakness of his left leg and underwent discectomy and fusion and everything at the level of... Uh, then he went still with weakness, no improvement. Then he went to another a surgeon that diagnosed him with actually upper motor neuron and with some weakness of the hand, but you know, the head, the leg was stiff already and the upper motor neuron. So he underwent discectomy at the level of the uh, cervical spine and then some fusion also of the cervical spine. He's, he was like 45 or so um, until he arrived to our stroke neurologist and they decided uh, not, not like, a, <laughs> not like a, a great idea, but they just did a brain MRI. And this is his brain MRI and you can see why the leg was first involved. He has multiple, multiple recurrent strokes um, in his right hemisphere. Um, then they did a CT angio at the level of the neck, and you can see this uh, this lesion. Now it's not the classical lesion, right? Not something like I I, I could say that it's uh, to start with the um, as a carotid web. Uh, we did an angiogram, and again some stagnation at this level, but not this classical appearance. Uh, that we uh, that we saw, um, we uh, took him to the OR, and this is uh, what we found when he opened it. Though this is this is a much larger carotid web, and it also looks different, right? It doesn't look like the same carotid web, but under the scope, similar features of carotid web. So here it's kind of more like a carotid endotrectomy. You see how how big is this uh, the whole lesion? But it was again kind of easy, I would say. Uh, to resect it, to develop this plane and resect it um, as, as, a, as a plaque or even more smooth than a, than a carotid plaque. Here I pu I'm pulling it out of the common carotid artery. Um, this is uh, taking it out of the internal carotid artery and finally from the external. This is still internal carotid artery. And this is taking it from the external and it's, uh, and it's out. Never had a recurrent stroke since then. Um, here it is before and after you can see that the, um, there's a normal vessel now. It really looks much, much better. What about location? So I said posterior, 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 posterior until I found this uh, um, this case report uh, that's from the Mayo Clinic. They actually um, they showed it to me. I didn't find it by myself. They approached me in one of these uh, talks that I'm giving about a carotid web, and they said, "You know what? We actually saw um, a carotid web uh, quite distal to the bifurcation." But you know, and they said, "Well, the, this patient arrived with a dissection, so maybe carotid webs are all dissections, small dissections that are healing." Um, which is which is which is a nice nice idea, but um, 
I'm not sure if it's right, especially because no one took it out, actually. That's only based on imaging. So I'm not sure if it's correct. However, we did have another patient with recurrent strokes, again, young patient. And you can see here this reconstruction, that's the level of this uh, uh, bifurcation. You can see something here on the 3D, but basically on the, uh, on the CT angiogram, you can definitely see a shelf-like, and now it's in the anterior wall of the internal carotid artery. So we, uh, again, did uh, kind of uh, multiple discussions with the stroke neurologist. Now they started trusting me with these carotid webs. So we took him to the OR, um, and uh, this is the bifurcation. This is the external, common, internal. So this region is actually the anterior region of the internal carotid artery, and you can see this is a carotid web. Uh, again, managed to create a very nice plane between the web and the, and the arterial wall, and it's out. Um, and under the microscope, it is definitely a carotid web, just in an anterior location. So it may happen as well. And now, what about asymptomatic carotid, uh, carotid web? Uh, we are seeing more and more carotid webs during the last few years, uh, because of, obviously we managed to create some more awareness. Uh, still not, um, you know, the best results, but, but we are getting better and better. Um, so this is a young patient that arrives to me now with, with asymptomatic because people started sending also asymptomatic carotid web and they're asking me what to do with these patients and I actually don't know. Um, so, and no one knows. Um, so for now, I just follow them. I don't treat them. I don't give them any uh, medications. Um, I just follow them clinically. Um, I'm trying to do some uh, MRIs uh, just to see that there are no silent strokes. That's the only reason. But there's no need to really follow the lesion because we know that these lesions are not growing. Um, um, and this made me think a lot about, uh, about all this kind of, like I would call it the angio architecture of the carotid web in respect to the bifurcation itself. I took some, some ideas from my previous life as a, as a pilot and I was thinking that maybe it kind of reminds me of a stall over a wing. Uh, which may be the, the angles between the web itself and the bifurcation and the creation of flow um, is the reason to, uh, to create this kind of turbulence and then develop this, this, um, this clot. So what we try to look into is all these multiple uh, angles between the common, the internal, the web and the external um, the sizes of the opening and the size of the carotid web. Um, and it was lots of, a lot of, of data um, um, on a very few patients. But this is the only option um, to kind of try to look into this, uh, this pathology that I was thinking a part of. Uh, and you'll see some more stuff that we are doing with flow models. But flow model is not a tool for the physician, for the neurologist, when he's looking, you know, at the patient with the CT angiogram, no, there are no tools. So I was trying to think what kind of a tool we can use. And uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Orenman at NYU has an AI lab um, that are dealing with machine learning. And I came with all this data and I asked him, do, do you think we might, might be able to find something uh, with some algorithms? And, uh, and he took all these all this numbers, all these angles and everything. And what he created is actually an algorithm. Um, that are taking all these numbers and creating algorithms. We compared it between the with asymptomatic and symptomatic. And you can see here on this 2D model that the uh, the normal the normal patients, the patients that were asymptomatic, are basically different. A part of to do this outlier here, basically they are different in respect to their this kind of algorithm that took all these numbers combined. Um, between these patients that presented with a stroke, symptomatic versus asymptomatic. So we were trying to look which feature, which feature is the most important thing, is the most important feature to separate between these two groups. We found five features, as you can see, and the most important one was the, actually the angle between the tip of this carotid web and the internal carotid artery. These are actually the five that we found. And you can see that the, 
the size of the opening of the, uh, the stenotic lesion is really has nothing to do with it. It's just the web itself, the angle between the web and the internal carotid artery mainly, and then um, the, um, the angles actually between the very tip and the trajectory, the first trajectory of the, um, of the flow in the common and in the internal. A more sophisticated project with, which we are doing with the, actually in combination with Emory is looking into these flow models and trying to compare them to, uh, uh, first of all, to the external carotid artery. And you can see the flow model, how nice and smooth and kind of uh, uh, circular, I would say, very symmetric um, flow model. And you can really get uh, quantitative results also from this uh, flow models. And you can see in the internal carotid artery, uh, the flow model really shows the flow below, above and below uh, the level of the carotid web. Um, and then we can create 3D, 3D analysis of the region, this specific region in the proximal internal carotid. Um, and this is the thrombogenic area that we feel that is there. And you can see this is based on real flow models. And the idea is, and we just uh, uh, submitted it for a, our one also in a combination, is to determine the composition of the clot itself. Then we'll use these flow models in order to see and to verify that this thrombogenic area is really different in respect to shear stress and other features. And then we're trying to combine the data that we have from Emory and the data that we have from, from NYU and to compare it in order to validate the flow models from Emory in respect to our uh, NYU patients. Next is, as you saw, that's another project that we're trying to look at is we, we might, our pathologist, Dr. Zagzag, um, is really uh, trying to try to assess whether there are different sub subcategories or subtypes of carotid web. You can see that in terms of histology, uh, they really look different. This is the one that I showed you that was the biggest one that we, we found. Then another one, the posterior wall, and another one, this is the one, the anterior wall. Maybe in terms of pathology, there are subtypes um, that we can try to see if maybe they are more thrombogenic themselves. Um, so our future directions, as, as you saw, flow, we are trying to look into flow models. We are trying to assess the clots and to uh, compare them to other uh, stroke mechanisms. Um, we are doing now, we are just starting now, uh, RNA sequencing on our 20 specimens that we have. Um, and uh, we'll try to um, apply for R21. We're trying to look for the relationship between the web and the bifurcation, as you saw, and we're looking into subtypes. That's in terms of the uh, lab work. In terms of uh, best treat treatment strategy, I wrote it, but I actually put a question mark. I don't think that anyone will go for randomized trial in these cases. These are really rare cases, um, and I don't think that it will ever happen. Um, and finally, obviously, we are trying to look at the natural history of asymptomatic carotid web just to follow them and see uh, which patient will uh, um, develop a stroke. So, in order to summarize, uh, I think that the most important thing is trying to raise the awareness of carotid webs um, as a mechanism for stroke in the young adult, uh, and specifically, um, trying to to raise the um, suspicion of carotid web in young female patient, African American, uh, with recurrent strokes, um, and very important to under to to take I think from my talk is that not all webs look like this classical carotid web. In terms of treatment options, we do believe that carotid antitrectomy is the best uh, option uh, with very low risk to the patient, definitive diagnosis and we avoid any kind of antiplatelet medication. Um, we do think that there is a place, there's a role for carotid stenting, especially for patients with more complex anatomy, extremely high uh, um, bifurcation or, you know, these kissing carotids uh, that are extremely medial and more difficult to reach in carotid antitrectomy. And finally, our future studies, I really think that we need to invest there uh, in order to find high-risk features, especially for patients with asymptomatic carotid web.
And uh, with that, I thank you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Can we talk again? Eric, of course. Yeah, Gary Friedman from uh, Brookdale Hospital. Um, with the asymptomatic uh, carotid web, it's a kind of a pedestrian question, but any possibility of checking the carotids with duplex and transcranial Doppler in terms of uh, distal flow as considering at the middle cerebral artery is a continuation of the internal carotid. Anything, uh, any ideas on that? No, I think it's actually a great idea. Um, the only problem is that I think that there's no significant difference in terms of their, of their flow, of their intracranial flow. I think it's mainly, the main issue is at the level of the neck. So you, you, I'm not sure that you'll find, but obviously every kind of measure that might give us any kind of clue to help these patients or to tell them at least, you know, risk certification. Um, I think it's good. I think it's very good. Would there be any uh, duplex findings in that area? Um, I didn't see any any um, paper or study that showed differences. But again, again, I, I think it's a good idea. We're not doing that routinely. Good question. Uh, as we're walking to to the other question, um, what about the TCDs for looking for hits for the embolic phenomenon? Um, absolutely, like a PFO. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, that's a that's a good idea in order to follow. Uh, small like silent strokes instead of instead of following with the MRI. I think it's I think it's a great idea. Give me more ideas. I'll take them home. Hi, Res. It's Dave. Hey, how Dave are you? Too. How are you? Good to see you. Likewise. Just a quick question. What you may want to look at is the pulsatility index, uh, specifically looking at the TCD. Uh huh. Where systolic, you know, subtracted from your diastolic over your mean velocity, and checking different segments and see if. If that may make a difference. In, you mean intracranially or at the level of the neck? Level of the neck. At or if you can neck. try intracranially, I mean, if you could, that would be uh, yeah. the ideal. You know, usually the, the, um, the results that we get are not so specific. Um, anyways, for um, even for carotid, you know, uh, for uh, atherosclerotic disease, uh, but I think it's good. And um, the problem is that it's um it's a really you know discrete lesion it's not like a very long segment so i'm not sure if the sensitivity is going to be good enough but 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 yeah yeah absolutely i'm trying to I'm, i follow anyways patients with ultrasound uh all my patients for carotid endotrectomy all standing with ultrasound uh with the duplex um so maybe we can add that as well um any other questions? Yes. Hi. Um, great talk. So in our population in Kentucky, we have a high rate of Moya Moya syndrome. So um, vascular um, abnormalities in the internal carotid. And there's a high rate of uh, autoimmune disease in these patients. So have you looked at autoimmune disease or anything else that might be contributing potentially to the pathology? Uh, we didn't look into autoimmune diseases yet, um, but uh, yeah, in these patients, it's Moya Moya syndrome. We call it because there's an underlying uh, issue. Um, no, we did not. We did not look at that. Yeah. Um, someone else. Oh. Hi. Ah, uh, you had the slide. Uh, we explained it was African American. Uh, females around young, kind of relatively young. Yeah. Why? Uh, just we like need you to know, ask the god of the statistics. Well, just like you know, in um heart, you know, you might not use beta blockers in certain groups and things. Why? What from your studies have you not looked into it? I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just. I'm asking to. to no, look. no, we did not look into it. It's just statistics. That's what we see, and that's uh, been shown not only in our. Uh, case here. Don't forget, these are all case here of top 25 patients, um, but all of them show that uh, there's a higher rate of symptomatic carotid webs about uh, within this specific group of patients. Um, so maybe and they I'm... don't have other FMD changes. They don't have anything else a part of that. So maybe another um, genetic study for R21 grant application. Yeah. 
So my question is, how can you reliably distinguish dissection, a partial dissection, just like you, you showed the anterior wall web, that case, from a, a true web other than resecting it? You cannot. Sometimes so, you just cannot. It's just, you know, features that are, I don't know, it's it's very difficult to to uh, to assess that. We're, we were thinking at a certain point to do some vessel wall imaging uh, that mm -hmm. will kind of distinguish between dissection, exactly, between dissection and web. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have, um, we don't have enough data about that yet. Because dissection can have a thrombus associated, so it's, so it's web. Yeah, yeah. But you can... Another question. Oh, of course, Nick. Thank you, Erez, very much, and uh, uh, I appreciate also your uh, your work on this because I, as you remember, I have referred you a patient that you treated very well. Uh, the question is, um, what would you recommend as the um, the best uh, imaging modality? You mentioned obviously there all kinds because uh, at least in my experience, sometimes you don't see it in the in the original CTA, for example. So yeah. you, you would recommend for all these patients to get angios or, or what would you? No, I don't think they need an angio. I actually don't think they need an angio. They just need the perfect CT angio with uh, reconstruction, good reconstructions. Because again, if you get just the axial and the reconstruction are kind of jumping, I don't know, every five millimeters or so, you, you will miss it. Because sometimes it's a narrow, very narrow segment and it's not like around the whole, like half of the circumflex of the of the wall you see what i mean and then it will just jump on it so you need thin slices good reconstructions and basically sagittal would be the best i don't think they need an angio okay, thank if you're you not sure and uh, you know and again you don't get the good ct angio and you, then i would do a C, uh, the um, a formal diagnostic angiogram in order to see the stagnation and uh, you should really ask specifically for a good Dynacity, um, and this dynacity needs to to take lots of contrast. You need to you need to give like five per. I don't know. It depends on the on the region, but you need to give lots of contrast, like five for sixty five. We are doing or something like that. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Karen Broom James from SUNY Downstate. I just wanted to know if you think there's any value in anticoagulant therapy for some of the patients as opposed to um, surgical resection? No, I don't think there's any, uh, it, it's a great question because many, many neurologists are asking me during the last few years, the, the, there are some case, uh, case series um, that are showing not, uh, not a minimal amount of recurrent strokes on top of anticoagulation and on top of dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, and as compared to carotid stenting and carotid endotrectomy, where there's basically zero in the literature, zero recurrence after this treatment. So it's a real significant difference between the, the options. Yeah, I have a question for you. This carotid wave, the way you beautifully describe and beautifully video do the surgery and get the patient relief and a young group, a, a very, very exciting practice. But my question is that you see the web is the right common carotid artery, internal carotid artery, external carotid artery. So you try to find the, the, what is the location anatomically and then do the surgery very nicely, dissection, and then pathology and confirm the diagnosis. I was just wondering, anatomically, these kind of arteries are present in other parts of the body, as for example, renal artery, external internal iliac arteries. So do you think there is any report of this kind of development of pathology of web in other arteries, and that can also give problem to the kidneys and lower extremity and vascular problem of the lower extremities? It's a, I think it's a great question. Um, I never heard about it. Probably because you know the symptoms are so obvious when it's carotid, right? Because all you know in the brain, so immediately you catch it, as compared to other organs that it's a more a little bit more difficult to see symptoms in 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 other organs. It's not like an immediate symptom. So I actually I don't know. 
it sounds to me that it, it might happen in other vessels. Why not? Right. Um, but it's probably in bifurcations out of different, different territories. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's a good question. Can you hear me? But carotid artery is one of the fastest flow arteries in the body because your vascular dimension. So that may be related to the flow. Kidney is the other one that's very rapid, but the flow is very, it's very fast, right? So maybe the shear force and anything potentially have something to do with, with the angulation. There's a question in, uh, on the, in the audience on the web um, asking a role for long-term thrombotics, you, which you mentioned there's no role of the post-op. Um, asymptomatic. Oh, post-op? Right. Post-op, so I keep them post-op for about four to six weeks on, on, uh, on aspirin. aspirin. They almost always come with aspirin from yeah. the neurologist. Yeah, yeah. I keep them for a few weeks just to, uh, just to allow the arteriotomy to heal, heal. well, yeah. and that's it. And right. There's no, nothing for long-term? No, nothing. But for asymptomatic, we don't know, we, we don't do anything, just follow, just like PFOs. Correct, correct. So in the beginning, when I just started, the, the stroke neurologist used to keep them for a longer period of time on antiplatelet. But then, you know, we had another discussion. I said, why, why, why do you keep saying, well, you know, we're, we're not sure what's going on. But now that we have like almost from the beginning, almost five years of follow up, they, they see that there's, there's not really no reason. Great. So we're stopping that. Very interesting. Great talk. Thank you so much. Thank Very you. Guys. Great seeing Thank you so much for it. That was a lunch break, everybody. <laughs>